we're looking at, uh, for our final class, we're looking at George Herbert. And uh, I don't even need this. I don't have any notes here. I'm talking. Uh, George Herbert. And George Herbert is in the school of John Donne. He's a metaphysical poet. Uh, you can see that his dates here roughly overlap with Dunn's, but he is uh, influenced by Dunn. Dunn's a much older man, but they die around uh, the same time. So those uh, holy sonnets that were published posthumously in uh, 1633, I said last class, that's the year that Herbert also dies. Uh, so Herbert died relatively young, um, uh, somewhat in unusual in his day. Uh, insofar as, I mean, if you look at statistics, they'll talk about, you know, the average age of life expectancy and so forth being in that age being far lower than it is today, which uh, has some truth uh, and validity, but it's skewed by the infant mortality rates. A lot of death in that world, uh, children dying in infancy, women dying in childbirth, but particularly children dying in uh, the first five years of their lives. So, so death is very much a part of their life uh, and experience, uh, not just death, but death of children. So it's a, it, it really, you can only imagine um, the effect on, on people when their children are dying young. And that, that was the experience of most of human history. Uh, some periods worse than others uh, and some places worse than others. But, um, uh, it's certainly formative. In, the, in these days when a child dies, uh, half the time it ends in a divorce. That's the effect of a child's death. Um, I, I won't get into the causes of that. I'm sure you could look into the whole reason why that is. It just the, the, bare, the bare facts suggest how traumatic it is and how uh, personally uh, destructive it is to uh, people to lose a child. At any rate, Herbert did not die as a child. Um, <coughs> he was a brilliant uh, scholar. He, was, uh, he went to Cambridge University. At that time, there are basically two universities in England. There's Cambridge and there's Oxford. Up in the northeast uh, in Scotland, there's one at St. Andrews as well at this stage, but uh, just those three ancient universities, I believe. And uh, Herbert went to Cambridge, he graduated from Cambridge, and then eventually he became the university orator, which meant that he would, on, he would represent the university on public occasions and speak on their behalf. And he would do so in Latin. So he would give speeches to dignitaries, official, like uh, to, to kings and queens, to other academics to, on occasion. So he, he, so he was a famous speaker. And he, his uh, star was on the rise, and he had a great career ahead of him. And um, so a brilliant mind and, uh, and highly capable, acknowledged as such with that uh, early uh, designation as a university orator. But he left that life. And I say this because this is what is particularly interesting about Herbert. He left that life to go into, to take on um, the priestly vocation. So he was an Anglican cleric. He loved Dunn. He followed many of Dunn's metaphysical conventions. We'll see some of them in Herbert's poetry. But uh, more than Dunn, I would say that he was influenced by um, Calvinist theology. He is an Anglican. Within, within Anglicanism, there's always been um, different wings. And uh, I would say that uh, Herbert was uh, of the broad church, but theologically not so. Uh, it's more, more what we would now call Calvinist uh, in its teaching. Now, Calvinism's changed a lot over time, right? Um, but uh, you can certainly see uh, that in one of the poems I'll just look at here. Um, which is on the board behind me. But he went and he retreated to a, not a large pulpit like uh, John Donne, St. Paul's, where he was, you know, the, one of the more famous churches in the London landscape, which makes it, uh, in English consciousness, a huge, uh, him a big deal. And Herbert, on the other hand, retreated to a little country parish and spent the rest of his life in obscurity, basically. And the poems that we are going to read, 
are from a collection that were called uh, that was called the Temple. And uh, as I say, he didn't publish them during his life. He wrote them for himself as a devotional act, almost. He was dedicating them to God. And when he died, he said uh, he left orders that if the executors chose, they could just get rid of them, burn them, whatever, or, or if they choose, chose so, they could publish them. And then they did so, and they were wildly popular, his poems, and read uh, frequently. Um, so this, uh, pub, this uh, edition of poetry called The Temple was read over and over, and it remains popular amongst Christians to this very day. Um, and some of Herbert's poetry is set to music and is a, a beloved part of English uh, hymnody as well. And I'm not going to look at the hymns, but I am going to look at some of the poems. But that it's called the Temple, uh, in part because the poetry itself, the the topics of the poems, and even in sometimes in this case the shape of the poems has a certain features that would fit in with the idea of the Temple. Now the Temple is in the uh, Old Testament, the place in which God's presence is said to dwell in the Holy of Holies, right, within the temple. Uh, after uh, Christ's advent, the temple, Jewish temple is destroyed, and yet there is the temple of his body, right? He says, destroy this temple and it will, I'll raise it up in three days. They're thinking, what, what's going on? You know, <laughs> is that possible? Um, the temple was destroyed. His body, on the other hand, was raised, and believers in uh, uh, Pauline theology are being uh, compared often to being living stones within the temple. So that analogy or metaphor of a temple persists even after uh, the Old Testament period and, and Herbert is going to use it in multiple senses. The temple will refer to the church building. There's some parts of it so he'll have poems called church windows and the altar and uh, church steps and the church door and the, all those sorts of things. So there are certain features of it. You walk into a church, a poem is about that. On the other hand, he is always never just talking about that on that level, that literal descriptive level of, but rather speaking of it as a personal aspect. So I am part of the body of Christ. I'm part of the temple of God. I'm part of Jesus Christ, I'm in his body. Paul's favorite phrase is to be in, in Christ. It's a funny description. Uh, we, we talk about having faith, uh, uh, and sometimes that can become a very intellectual expression, right? And it's not that it isn't an intellectual expression, but that's not, and, and Paul talks about faith, of course, as well and belief in God. And of course, there is an intellectual aspect, but there's also, to some degree, a, uh, a material aspect of being in a body, and also that body being a temple. And that temple, if we looked last time at Dunn, being a part of a city, and also part of a bride. These uh, metaphors are used throughout scripture uh, in ways that if you held them uh, to be physical descriptions would be ridiculous. Right? But nobody understands it that way. There's a mystical sense in which these things are true, and in fact, in which the Old Testament is um, pointing forward to the